we've got Dr. Harry on. This is Harry Adelson from Dosere, or Dosere Clinics. And Harry is a great friend and he led the six body, or six body, six hands, whole body stem cell makeover um, that I did. This is a big part of my uh, anti-aging strategy where he and two other doctors put stem cells everywhere in the body. You can have them spine, every joint, face, hair, dick, uh, all those things. And uh, uh, I'm feeling upgraded. And so he's on though to talk about inflammation, immune systems and stem cells. So Harry, welcome my friend. Thank you so much. All right, let's uh, just go to some questions for people. If you have questions about, uh, uh, about any of this stuff, look at that beaker. What beaker are we talking about? This, this one? <laughs> you're talking about the other beaker. I know you're talking about Muppets. All right, so stem cells. Um, why would you consider stem cells or exosomes for COVID? Well, I think stem cells is probably, stem cell therapy shows promise more than anything else. So if we sort of back up and look at the, what we do know about the pathophysiology is, you know, the thing that we want to avoid is this cytokine storm. Cytokine storm is where you produce all these inflammatory cytokines. And what that does is it just, your, your immune system gets stuck in an activated state. And it actually like creates like a form of autoimmune disease. The most classic uh, example of this is graft versus host disease. If somebody has like an organ transplant or something, um, then they just produce so many cytokines that the body attacks itself. Well, what stem cells do is they donate their mitochondria to the T cells, which are the most important of the uh, immunity cells. And that it causes that cell to differentiate into a regulatory T cell. Regulatory T cells actually downregulate the immune response and, and are used for treatment for autoimmune disease. So there, there are a number of studies happening right now using stem cell therapy to uh, treat people who are on ventilators in comas and in bad shape. And the, the, the data that's out so far is very promising. So everyone's asking right now, um, how much are stem cells? So what is it? What is a, a vial of exosomes, which is sort of the stem cell factors you're talking about that you believe could be really active against this? Um, um, so, so if someone was just going to do intravenous exosomes, for instance, it, I think it's, I think it's twenty one hundred dollars or something like that. Okay, so it's not cheap. Uh, however, cheaper than a night in an emergency room almost anywhere. Um, here's one from that funky bitch. Uh, funny name, P H U N K Y. She's saying, "Why not use herbs to control inflammation?" And on the podcast we just recorded, that'll be going live in the next. I think on the thirtieth, like the next day or two. Um, we do talk a little bit about the and herbs and for IL-6 specifically. Would you do herbs with stem cells for this? I are think, you, are okay. you you're asking me? I think stem cells, yeah. I, I think, yeah, I think herbs are a great way to go. Um, I'm unclear on the question. Um, would you do herbs with stem cells? Yeah, you bet. Yeah, I think there's there's lots of that article that you put out on how to prevent and potentially treat COVID lists all the most important herbs. Um, so I would just refer people to that article because you hit them all. Um, would you, though, at the same time that you're introducing exosomes, is it OK to have the stem cells and anti-inflammatory herbs or would you space them out? I, I, mean, think it, would... I think it would be fine. I wouldn't administer them, but if people had them on board, that would be no problem at all. Okay, so, yeah, but that's not really in the scope of your practice on it, but you, if someone was doing anti-inflammatory herbs, it would be in alignment with it. Yeah, okay. they, we ask people to get off anti-inflammatory drugs, but anti-inflammatory herbs work along different pathways and, and are fine to continue. Okay. Um, what we talked about on the podcast is that there are actually uh, a few studies internationally of cultured umbilical stem cells. Um, and this is something that's not available in the U.S. because of regulatory uh, things, but it's widely used elsewhere. And they actually had efficacy against COVID. Was it like 10 of 12 people got off the ventilator? Yeah, well, there's, those? there's a number of case studies coming out of China that are showing really quite dramatic improvement, getting people off ventilators, getting people recovered. Uh, then there's two studies that have been done sort of in the Western Hemisphere, one in uh, Israel, 
uh, which I believe is the Western Hemisphere, maybe, <laughs> uh, and, and the other here in the U.S., uh, and that, and the one that was here in the U.S. was 12 patients. So this is just the preliminary findings. So, I mean, this is a big study that's going to be ongoing over the next, the coming months. But what's been released just like three days ago is that out of 12 people, 10 of them came off the ventilator, which is 82%, which is the opposite of normally, if you get on a ventilator, you have, you know, it's, I think it's an 88% chance that you're not going to come off the ventilator. Yeah at least in New York. By the way, for, for people with, that's a really scary statistic, the normal percentage of people who come off ventilators successfully is only 20%. So 80% of the time you go on a ventilator, you're toast. But if you have COVID and you go on a ventilator, it's 88% of the time. So it, it's, it's worse, but ventilators are pretty much uh, a very bad situation anyway. Um, here's a question, interesting. So Strings of Jupiter says, there's been a lot of focus on mitochondria in the nootropic world. Yeah, who do you think created the world's first whole body broad spectrum nootropic based on mitochondria? It's called Unfair Advantage, it's my product. So does taking mitochondrial supplements somehow potentiate stem cells in our bodies? This is a really interesting question. So as a stem cell guy, do you recommend mitochondrial enhancement before, during, or after a procedure, and if so, why? Um, I, I would say all of the above, I mean, that's, uh, it's not something we regularly recommend, but the little bit that I know about it, I think it would be perfectly safe to do leading up to the treatment and then shortly thereafter. Okay. Um, Transform with Kelly says uh, IV um, or injected, uh, as in like IM or, or intramusco. I think the answer would be IV mm -hmm. uh, uh, based on our interview. Is that correct? But, so to be clear, you know, I don't treat COVID here at my clinic. I treat musculoskeletal pain disorders. Yeah, but well, that's why you're allowed to. I, I get it. Sure. <laughs> But for the for the for these studies that are coming out of Israel and, and then mm -hmm. recently the U.S. and China, these are all intravenous studies. Have you ever had a uh, I don't know a patient come in coughing, uh, saying I have musculoskeletal pain? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> just checking. Yeah. <laughs> um, Ty says andrographics is great for L six. Yeah, that's the top herb I recommend in my piece. Andrographics is something I use when I fly to make sure I don't get sick anyway. Um, let's see. Um, here we go. I'm looking, speaking of China, okay, can we talk about a bunch of conspiracy stuff that no one knows unless they're the ones who did it? We're not gonna do that. By the way, it might be real, might not, but there's no way you or me are gonna know and we can totally spend all of our time thinking about it and waste all that mitochondria energy that could have gone into doing something. So speculation doesn't doesn't fix the problem. So uh, I'm going to recommend that you focus on um, being highly resilient uh, and uh, whatever happened will come out after you're dead, probably. Um, and if you don't believe me, who killed Kennedy? All right, that isn't even out. So until then, let's not worry about the conspiracies. Let's worry about solving the problem. Uh, all right, what are we talking about? Interpersonal and neurobio healing. We're talking about stem cells and COVID and inflammation. I'm, I'm looking here to find some, uh, some good things. All right, there's this douchebag named Wolf, whatever. Um, all right, you were, you were spamming the last thing. I'm gonna ban you and you'll never see one of these again. So either cut that shit out or I'm banning you the second we get off this and I'll just be invisible to you and you'll miss me. There we go. All right. Uh, here we go, let's see. You know how many hearts I just got for, for that? So Wolf, you're getting more social engagement for me by being such a douche, thank you. Other questions I love. Anything that Bulletproof Diet you would avoid? Uh, let's see, I'm guessing this might be a question for you. Um, you know, would you be concerned about your higher fats or anything like that? Concerned about, I didn't hear the question. Oh, the question is uh, anything on the Bulletproof diet you might avoid during COVID or during stem cells. So, I mean, I'm like, what, what would you criticize in the Bulletproof diet? Or are there any things that you'd recommend we don't do? Um, um, I, I think that you, people really lose their appetites. People who get sick completely lose their appetites. So I'd say anything that works, as long as you stay, you know, keep eating. And, yeah. if it, and I, I don't see any problem with the Bulletproof diet. But I actually do see a problem with a bulletproof diet if you're um, dealing with COVID. And this is in a blog post um, that's coming up here. And there are phases of the bulletproof diet. This is not a keto bro, dirty keto diet. There's so many kind of knockoffs, like just never eat a carb again and you'll be strong. It, it actually doesn't work like that. So 
the studies show that when you have a viral infection, having glucose present increases your ability to heal. But when you have a bacterial infection, having glucose present makes the bacterial infection worse. So what do you have? Do you have COVID, which is viral? In which case you would want to have some glucose, but not high blood sugar because that suppresses immunity. So basically you should have some carbs with some fat and some protein so you don't get a blood sugar spike, but you have enough blood glucose because you'll probably win, right? So that means on the Bulletproof diet, don't be in a ketogenic phase of the diet when you're cycling in and out. Be at a phase where you're having some carbs, especially at dinner, but you're not going crazy on the sugar. So it's a small tweak. And should you always have ketones present? Yes, there are all sorts of reasons from an inflammatory perspective. You want ketones present, so pour some brain octane on whatever the heck it is you're eating. It'll raise your ketones. Have your coffee, which doubles ketone production in the morning. Uh, that's an effect of caffeine. I think you're going to be good. All right, Harry, what, uh, let, let's go away from just, uh, you know, just the COVID question here and, and things like that. I've been meaning to ask you this. How often, if cost is no object, uh, you know, and I'm planning to live to 180, how often should I do a whole body, you know, six hands, stem cell, heavy duty makeover? I mean, and guys, just to be clear, this is something that's like, you know, a heavily loaded Tesla level of, you know, many, it, it, it's a very, very big rejuvenation procedure as close to the Captain America, you know, they put you in a chamber and you come out change thing that I know of. But, you know, if, if this is available for everyone, it was affordable. How often is this a once every five year kind of thing? Once every two years, once every 10 years? Like, like, yeah, so, so I, I think what you said five years, that's sort of what I have in mind. Okay. So the idea with full body stem cell makeover, we take a large volume of bone marrow stem cells, a relatively large volume of fat derived stem cells, supplement that with a bunch of exosomes, and then we inject that into basically all the moving parts of the body, the entire spine from the base of the skull down to the tailbone at every level, turn the person over both shoulders, both elbows, both wrists and thumbs, both hips, both knees, both ankles and great toes. Now, the reason I wouldn't go more than five years is because we're taking quite a few stem cells out of the body. We're putting them right back in, but we're, uh, we're temporarily reducing the population in their, you know, in the bone marrow and in the fat. Now they very quickly regenerate and replenish, but if you do that too often, theoretically you could shorten telomere length. So I think once every five years would be prudent. Once every five years. Uh, I'm getting one more question that, that's useful around post COVID infection protocols. Um, and uh, our mutual friend Matt's doing uh, some work with those um, that do include exosomes. Um, I've look anytime you're exposed to hypoxic damage to the cells, which is what you're getting from COVID. Um, then you're going to need to replenish cells. And you got to look at hyperbaric. Uh, and this is something that's well understood. I've interviewed Dr. Harch uh, on the show about that. For the neurological side, I'd be, frankly, in the middle of an attack, I'd be in hyperbaric as much as I could to keep the tissues oxygenated. But aside from exosomes, which, uh, which I, I, we've already talked about, and stem cells directly, is there anything else you would look at doing as you know, a, a musculoskeletal person? People do have musculoskeletal pain after uh, COVID some of the time. What would you look at doing? I'm just giving your medical knowledge. Well, one of the unit, one of the things that I'm about that I'm adding is that ozone dialysis, where you take the entire volume of blood, put it through a machine, filter the blood, ozonate the blood, and then put it through ultraviolet blood irradiation, put it back into the body. Um, so that's something that, and that you've talked about that. You know, Matt Cook, we know, does that. Uh, I'm getting the same unit that Matt has. Um, cool. I think that's probably like my. I've, good friend of mine, a guy I used to share my practice with, uh, just got off three weeks on the ventilator. And he's going to be the first person I'm going to treat with that, with the ozone dialysis. Uh, very, very cool. Yeah. Thank you for all the injections. Thank you for all the knowledge. Thank you for all the uh, anti-inflammatory exosome talk for all the people tuned in on the channel. If you guys ever want stem cells, you have pain. Uh, Dr. Harry, um, did the first uh, stem cell procedure I ever had done. He's done many of my stem cell procedures. Some of them are on video. They're all in my books. Uh, and he's one of the guys who really fought the good fight to even get these to be allowed in the U.S. So thank you, Harry. Thanks, Dave.